Good afternoon to everyone. Many thanks for attending this event. The Kansas State University Department of Mathematics is hosting a women lecture series in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Association for Women in Mathematics. The women lecture series includes distinguished lectures and colloquium talks by women mathematicians planned throughout 2021. Today, we have a Harry E. Valentine lecture by Emily Rill from Johns Hopkins University who will be speaking about contractibility as uniqueness. Today's lecture is funded by a gift from Ned and Sherry Valentine of Clay Center and Manhattan to the Kansas State University Foundation. The purpose of the gift is to honor the memory of Harry E. Valentine and to provide funds from the interest on the endowment for lectures to be given by internationally prominent mathematicians. The lecture series emphasizes mathematics as a foundational discipline for science, commerce, and the arts. The lectures also underscore the fact that mathematics is a creative field and that mathematical research is a response both to the needs of other sciences and to its own inner dynamic, which compels the study of abstract patterns. Today's speakers, Emily Riedel, is an associate professor of mathematics at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Prior to coming to Johns Hopkins University, she was a Benjamin Pierce and NSF postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. She earned her PhD in 2011 from the University of Chicago, a certificate of advanced study in 2007 from the University of Cambridge, and a BA in 2006 from Harvard. She's the author of two books, Categorical Homotopy Theory and Category Theory in Context, and a co-author of a forthcoming research manuscript, Elements of Infinite Category Theory, co-written with her longtime collaborator, Dominic Verity. There will be a Q&A at the end of the talk. You are welcome to submit questions through the live chat in YouTube by signing it with a Gmail account. My colleagues, Rina Anno and David Yeter will monitor the questions in the chat and will read them to Emily once the presentation is over. Emily, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Uh, great. Uh, thanks so much. It's really an honor uh, to be here. I'm sorry I'm not able to be uh, physically at Kansas State, especially because I have so many colleagues in the department. But um, I guess the silver lining is it's nice to um, have an opportunity to talk to whoever's on YouTube these days. Um, okay, so uh, here we go. Um, so the my goal for the talk today is to explain a new idea that happens to come up in uh, both of the fields of mathematics in which I work. Uh, so one of these is infinite dimensional category theory, sort of so-called infinity categories. And then another area is homotopy type theory, which is a new vision for uh, the foundations of mathematics. And in both of those contexts, the sort of classical logical notion of uniqueness, say a problem having a unique solution is replaced by contractibility conditions. So the space that parameterizes all possible solutions to the problem is a contractible space, meaning that there's a continuous deformation from that space down to a single point. So I'm going to try and explore this idea um, first in an example that comes up in higher category theory. So an infinite dimensional category theory and then by uh, sort of exploring uh, using some techniques from category theory, uh, an analogy between the logical expression of the uniqueness condition and uh, something else that we'll see. Um, and I'll make the connection to homotopy type theory at the very end. Um, I'm very happy to be interrupted uh, during the talk. So please uh, don't be shy uh, asking questions. And uh, uh, thanks to uh, Rena and David for uh, keeping an eye on all that for me. Okay, so let's just go ahead and begin. So uh, let's imagine uh, your favorite topological space. So I've drawn a cartoon picture of a topological space here. And uh, there are various techniques in algebraic topology to sort of distinguish a space A from other spaces um, that involve uh, computing some sort of algebraic invariant of the space. So uh, translating it from a problem in topology to a problem in algebra. So what might informally be described as the algebra of paths associated to a fixed space A uh, can be described in increasing precision by various constructions. So the simplest of these constructions, something that you sometimes meet in an undergraduate topology course is something called the fundamental group. So the fundamental group, um, pi one A of X, 
So this is a construction that takes as input a space A, but also a fixed point X, which is the base point. So the fundamental group is a group uh, whose elements are loops in A based at X. So in other words, that's a path through the space A that starts and ends at X, uh, except that's not quite right. So I've drawn here one of these loops, so a path through the space A that starts and ends at X. Uh, that will represent an element of the fundamental group. But if I, maybe I'll give it a name F, if I draw another loop that's kind of similar, just sort of a little bit off from that F, so this is a second loop F prime. Uh, these uh, loops are connected by something called a homotopy. So if the loops themselves are paths, a homotopy is a path between paths. You can imagine having a continuous deformation that at time zero gives you the loop F and at time one gives you the loop F prime. So it continuously deforms the one loop to the other. And because those two loops are deformable, they represent the same element in the fundamental group. So this kind of complicated picture that I've drawn here involving a base, base point X and uh, this loop F and this loop F prime, um, these this represent a single element of the fundamental group. Now that there will be other elements of the fundamental group, I could have drawn instead a loop that goes in this direction, uh, this loop, G is not homotopic to the loops F or F prime, so it will represent a distinct element. Okay, so uh, that's one uh, algebraic invariant that expresses the algebra of paths in the space. Um, there's a natural generalization which says that, you know, maybe we should have a construction of this that doesn't privilege a particular point X. So the fundamental groupoid is like the fundamental group, um, but it's a category rather than a group. So a category is something that has objects, in this case, all of the points in the space. So I have X, Y, Z, any point in the space is an object. So this is a really large category. And then a morphism in this category from X to Y is no longer necessarily a loop, but a path. So here's a path K that goes from X to Y. That would be, that would represent a morphism in the fundamental groupoid, pi one of A of paths in A. But again, this isn't quite right. So we're a single morphism from X to Y is not uh, just an individual path, but a homotopy class of paths. So if I had some other path K prime, that's continuously, uh, that's homotopic to K. So there's a continuous deformation from K to K prime. Then those represent a single uh, morphism in the fundamental group wide. So these are the same arrow from X to Y. And then there are others because of course we also have some paths from Y to Z and from Z to W and from Y to W. And uh, this, this again is quite a big construction. Okay, so um, there's something that's uh, maybe a little inelegant, though, about uh, the fundamental group and the fundamental groupoid. What's reassuring is that a group is a relatively familiar object. A groupoid may be less familiar, but not terribly complicated. Um, but to sort of contort the path algebra of A into these sort of familiar structures, we had to consider you know not just loops and paths but loops and paths up to homotopy and the final construction this thing called the fundamental infinity groupoid uh somehow really just expresses the path algebra so the the paths themselves each individual path are going to play a more central role here so let me tell you about that last construction so the fundamental groupoid so the notation here is pi infinity a of a space a has so this, uh, like the fundamental groupoid was a, a category, it had objects and then arrows between those objects. Uh, this is an example of an infinite dimensional category, a weak infinite dimensional category. So like in the fundamental groupoid, um, each point in the space represents an object. So we have lots of points, lots of uh, objects. Uh, then uh, as in the fundamental groupoid, a path, in A from X to Y defines an arrow. Now I'm calling it a one dimensional arrow because we're gonna see higher dimensional arrows in just a second. So this is a one dimensional arrow from X to Y, but now I don't have to take homotopy classes. So each individual path, if I had my F and my F prime, these are distinct arrows from X to Y in the fundamental infinity groupoid. And of course I have many other arrows that I can imagine here. Uh, we could be here all day if I tried to draw them all. Um, 
Okay, so these are the objects and the one dimensional arrows in the fundamental infinity groupoid. So far, the comparison with the fundamental groupoid is we're not taking homotopy classes, but we're not throwing away the homotopies either. So uh, a homotopy, so as uh, we observed previously, these paths F and F prime are homotopic, they're continuously deformable from one to another. Uh, in the fundamental infinity groupoid, the homotopy, an explicit homotopy, so an explicit continuous deformation, is a two-dimensional arrow. It's part of the data of the fundamental infinity groupoid. So the fact, uh, so a particular uh, homotopy from the path F to the path F prime is encoded in this fundamental infinity groupoid as one of these two-dimensional arrows. And there are many other homotopies. I could uh, draw a homotopy between sort of the concatenation of this path F prime in this path G and some other path, I could call it L. Um, there is not a, a two-dimensional arrow. There's not a homotopy in here because this uh, hole in the space provides an obstruction, but I could you know, have a path along the back and I could have another uh, homotopy. So these homotopies between paths are uh, the two-dimensional arrows, um, but we can continue uh, with three-dimensional arrows. So. Um, imagine that my space A is not the surface of this blob shape, so it's not a oriented surface of genus three, but instead it's solid, so it's made out of dough. Um, then I could imagine uh, having, say here I have my homotopy alpha, my two dimensional arrow, my homotopy beta, I could have uh, maybe through the back of the surface another path, uh, which I'll call P and some other homotopies connecting, uh, sort of filling in the region between P and L and between uh, P and F and G. And the uh, four homotopies that I've drawn here, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, I guess I used gamma twice, uh, bound a three-dimensional region. And that might be inhabited by a three-dimensional arrow. This is a homotopy between homotopies between paths. Uh, opposed to just a homotopy between paths. So this is a continuous map from a three-dimensional shape into uh, A, and that's a three-dimensional arrow, and this continues all the way up. So you might ha imagine having these three-dimensional arrows bound some shape that uh, could be filled by a four-dimensional arrow, and then an explicit continuous map that fills that would be a, a four arrow and so on. And this continues in all dimensions. So this uh, fundamental infinity groupoid is uh, kind of a considerably more elaborate structure than um, the uh, fundamental group or the fundamental groupoid. So um, there's an advantage to thinking about the fundamental infinity groupoid. So the fundamental group and the fundamental groupoid only really see the low dimensional structure in a topological space. They don't, uh, they can't tell whether a um, sort of two dimensional shape is necessarily filled by a higher homotopy or not. They're just not sensitive to that sort of information. They can't distinguish between uh, the two sphere and a uh, point. Um, for instance. Um, whereas this fundamental infinity groupoid, this more complicated construction that we're seeing here is what's called the complete invariant of the space. It, it uh, completely captures the homotopy type of the topological space. Um, if you're familiar with the construction of the total singular complex in algebraic topology, that's another way to think about this fundamental infinity groupoid. Uh, the disadvantage though, is it's a much less familiar structure. I mean, um, most of us are familiar with groups and um, many of us are familiar with groupoids, but infinity groupoids are a pretty exotic object and it's maybe not so clear even what the definition of, is an, of an infinity groupoid is or what it's like to work in one. So for instance, here's a very natural question to ask about the fundamental infinity groupoid, which is how do we define the composite of fundamental group was a group um, that implied that we had some sort of concatenation operation. And similarly, for the fundamental groupoid to be a groupoid, we needed some composition operation. So in the fundamental infinity groupoid, we might ask how we compose paths. And the answer is that we don't actually, we don't define the uh, composite of paths. Instead of having a composition operation, so some sort of function that would take one path F and another path G and return their composite path, we think of composites of paths as being witnessed by homotopies. So here I've drawn a picture which has one of these two dimensional arrows alpha, that's a homotopy filling this space uh, bounded by the paths F, G, and K. And we think of this alpha as a witness that K is a composite of G with F. 
So because of this alpha, we could think of K as one of many possible composites of G with F. But you can imagine having other paths that also play that role. There will be, in general, many, many different paths that could serve as a composite of G with F. Um, so there's no, uh, in the fundamental infinity group where there's no sort of specified composite, instead, uh, we sort of recognize when composites exist. We're replacing a function by a relation, though it's really this kind of generalized sort of relation where uh, you know, there's information provided by this alpha, a particular reason why K is a composite of G with F. And you could have a different two-dimensional arrow, which would uh, give different information. Okay, but then the next question is how unique this is. So usually in an ordinary group, if you have two elements, there's a unique composite element. And in an ordinary group, right, if you have two things like two paths, there should be a unique composite path. Um, so it's natural to ask how unique this uh, sort of weak composition operation is. And a partial answer is that it's unique enough for associativity. So let's think about that. So if I have uh, three composable paths, so this F, this G, and this H, and I have specified homotopies. So here's an alpha witnessing that K is a composite of F with G and a beta witnessing that L is a composite of H with G and a gamma witnessing that M is a composite of L with F. So together, this is telling us that M is a composite of H with G composed with F. Uh, then I could uh, combine, I could sort of concatenate these specific two-dimensional arrows, this alpha, this beta, and this gamma, to uh, construct a new two-dimensional arrow that fills the outside of this diagram. So this composite arrow, um, and I, sh I should say homotopies are invertible. So if uh, you're confused by the way that I've drawn the particular two-dimensional arrows and you'd prefer I reversed one of them, please go ahead and do so. Um, so this composite of alpha and beta and gamma is defining some two-dimensional arrow that uh, fills the back of this triangle. And that's then a witness that this M, which previously we thought of as a composite of H with G composed with F, can also be thought of as a composite of this H uh, with K, which was via the witness alpha, a composite of G with F. And so that's uh, associativity. Though actually more precisely, you might imagine that we already had a witness, maybe I'll call it delta, which is some homotopy filling this back triangle um, that M could be regarded of a composite of H and K. Then uh, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta bound, form the boundary of a tetrahedron, so a three-dimensional shape. And we can imagine having a three-dimensional arrow inside that shape that is a witness to a coherence condition between the witnesses of the two-dimensional arrows. That's really the data of an associativity. And this isn't at all the end of the story. So if we were considering four composable arrows or five composable arrows or six composable arrows, the sort of coherence data that witnesses the associativity of that composition would be four and five and six dimensional, and this continues all the way up. Okay, so uh, we do have some notion of composition in the fundamental infinity group, right? And it is associative in some sense, but we still haven't answered this question about how unique are composites in the fundamental infinity group, right? And uh, we're gonna prove a theorem. A thing that we can say is that the space of composites of two paths, F and G, in a topological space A is a uh, contractible space. So this is our first uh, encounter with this notion of contractibility. So this is the theorem that we're gonna prove is we have a fixed topological space A. We're thinking about two paths in A. So uh, these paths should be composable paths. So F goes from X to Y, G goes from Y to Z. Uh, here's my F and here's my G. Actually, I'll, I'll do that later. Um, so uh, we've uh, understood what it means to have a composite of F and G. Now I'm gonna form the space that contains all of those composites. And the claim is that that's a contractible space. It's continuously deformable to a point. Okay, so to prove this, the first thing we have to do is define the space of composites. So let's start by doing that. So I'm gonna realize the space of composites. I made up some notation comp FG. I'm gonna realize it as a subspace of a mapping space. So here I've used exponential notation to denote the space of continuous maps from a triangle shape. So from a, a two simplex, it's a filled triangle into A. So this A to the triangle is the notation for the space whose points are continuous maps from a solid triangle into A. Okay, so... Um, you could imagine, you know, just a, a continuous map from a solid triangle into A. 
you know, here's maybe the image of such a map that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with F and G. So I'm going to restrict to a particular subspace of that space. Uh, I want to impose the condition that when I continuously map my triangle into A, when I look at this particular edge or this particular pair of edges, so that's what I'm representing with this subspace here, I want those particular edges, this one and this one, to map to the specified paths F and G. So uh, here I've drawn a pullback diagram in the category of spaces. What it's saying is that this space comp FG, the space of composites, is the fiber of this restriction map. So in other words, uh, a point in the space is a continuous map from the triangle into A, with the condition that when I restrict to these two edges of the triangle, it maps to the path F and to the path G. So what's left free is the choice of the composite path K and the choice of the witnessing homotopy alpha. That's how we're defining this space. Okay, so that's the space of composites. Now the theorem states that the space of composites are contractible, is a contractible space. We're gonna meet two different definitions of contractibility in this talk, but the one that's useful here is as follows. So a space is contractible uh, just when any sphere mapping into the space uh, can be filled into a disc. So sphere is a shape that bounds a solid disc. So um, what do I mean? So here's our space of uh, composites, which we defined as some subspace of this mapping space. So uh, we can cons continue, consider a continuous map from a sphere of an arbitrary dimension into the space. So if this space is contractible, then any continuous map, no matter where we decided to send it, extends along the inclusion of the sphere into the disk uh, to a continuous map from the disk into the space. So this is a way of saying that there are no holes in the space, no higher dimensional holes, any, any sphere can be filled to a disk. Okay, so our task is to define this blue map that now I've uh, covered in pink. Um, given any sphere, I, I need to dis define this blue extension. Now, since I defined this space of composites as a pullback in topological spaces, sort of as a subspace, to define this dash blue map, it suffices to instead define a continuous map from uh, the disk dn into the mapping space of continuous maps from the triangle into a satisfying the conditions that this bottom triangle commutes and this top triangle commutes so that's what we're going to do instead so to prove that our space is contractible what i need to do is uh, given a rectangle like this outer rectangle here i need to define this continuous map making both of those triangles commute and what's useful about that is I can kind of rearrange this diagram. So the data of this rectangle, the data of this top composite is a continuous map from the sphere into the mapping space from the triangle into A. So that transposes to a map from the product of the sphere with the triangle into A. So that's kind of one component here. And then the data of this bottom map is a continuous map from the disk into this wedge shape mapping into A. And that transposes to a continuous map from this product space into A. And the fact that this rectangle commuted says that these glue together along their com common subspace. So this is a name for topological space in dimension n equals one. It kind of looks like a trough uh, that you could put uh, pig feed in, for instance, or something like that. It's uh, empty in the middle, empty on the top, and then solid on all of the other sides. So our task is to extend uh, to this green map, which goes from the disk into the mapping space from the triangle into A. So I'm trying to extend uh, to the solid trough, which is the, the uh, product of the disk with the triangle, and I need to extend along here. And no matter what the space A is, this extension is always possible. And the reason is that this inclusion admits a deformation retract. So there's a continuous function from uh, the disk across the triangle back into this subspace. It's really a deformation retract. So you can imagine if you had your trough full of pig food and then the pigs sort of eat it all straight down, uh, that's a sort of continuous mapping that goes back here. And this composite is then the dashed composite that we so, so this extension exists uh, since the inclusion admits a continuous deformation retraction, um, and that's the proof. Great. Okay, so what's the summary? Um, so uh, we were comparing and contrasting uh, two different encodings of the algebra of paths for a space A. So the first one is something called the fundamental groupoid. That groupoid is like a category or like a group. Um, and in a groupoid, part of the definition is that any composable pair of arrows necessarily has a unique composite. Uh, the fundamental infinity groupoid, this was the full algebra with the points and the paths and the homotopies and higher homotopies. 
Here, uh, we proved that any composable pair of arrows has a contractible space of composites, and that's really part of the definition of an infinity groupoid in general. So it's a requirement in an infinity groupoid that any composable pair of arrows has a contractible space of composites. So this is the first instance where we move from sort of ordinary mathematics, ordinary category theory to higher dimensional mathematics or higher category theory, where a uniqueness condition is replaced by a contractability condition. And now we're going to see if we can tighten up this analogy. Um, but let me pause for a second and see if there are any questions first. Uh, there is a question. Uh, what sort of data can be extracted from considering the fundamental infinity groupoid of an allenberg maclean space that you could not gather from the basic data of the fundamental group? Great, uh, that's a great question. So uh, let's go back to the beginning and uh, kind of recall what these definitions are. So uh, one thing about the fundamental group is because you uh, have to pick a point X in the space, you only ever see one path component of the space. So here I drew a picture of a space A that's path connected, meaning any two points can be connected by a path, but maybe there's some sort of other junk over here. There's another component of A and the fundamental group wouldn't see it at all because there are no loops from X that go into this other component and then come back. So that's one failing of the fundamental group. Now that is uh, rectified by the fundamental groupoid, which in this case would be a disconnected category and would also include loops over here. Um, but, uh, Really, and this is kind of indicated by the fact that the notation for these has these uh, subscripts one, uh, these are only seeing the low dimensional data of the space. So the fundamental groupoid uh, of here, I've drawn A to look something like a surface. It can detect how many uh, holes there are in the surface. So I have these, uh, these sorts of holes um, here, but it uh, can't tell about what's going on in higher dimensions. So uh, it could not, uh, um, I mean, I, the simplest example of this is, is one that I mentioned briefly that I'll restate. If I look at uh, S2, um, which is the topological space, uh, it's the boundary of a ball. So this is S2. It's fundamental groupoid. So pi one of S2 is equivalent uh, to the terminal category. So there's a, essentially just, a, what this is saying, I guess, is up to homotopy. If I had any two points in this space, firstly, any two points are connected by a path. You can always draw a path between any two points, but moreover, up to homotopy, there's exactly one path between any two points. Because if I draw any other path, I can always fill this into a disk. So that's the meaning of saying that this is a uh, equivalent to the terminal category. Um, uh, so the terminal category is also uh, the fundamental groupoid of the point. So I'm using star in two different ways here. This is the terminal category. Uh, this is the one point space, but S2 and the one point space are not equivalent. These, uh, these spaces are not homotopy equivalent. S2 has this higher hole that it's empty inside where it's not a contractible space. And the fundamental group void just doesn't see that. So um, if you're familiar with the higher homotopy groups, the fundamental infinity group void has these higher homotopy groups baked in. And so it really does see the higher structure of the, the space. Um, and there's a more- The question was specifically about applying the construction to a, um... To, to, to an Eilenberg McLean space, which I think then <laughs> has so, somehow there cha changes the answer because Eilenberg McLean spaces are deliberately constructed to be kind of boring in terms of higher homotopies. <laughs> right, but it's, I mean, Eilenberg McLean spaces could be like K pi n, right? So okay. that. Won't I, I, the, the spirit of the question seemed to be K pi ones because because, because they asked about specifically what what more than the fundamental group. I see. Think. Okay, sure. Well, if right, if your space is known already to have no higher homotopy, then uh, there's no higher information in the fundamental infinity groupoid. Uh, I, yeah, I won't disagree with that. So uh. there, there was another question just came in, and it was: Is it useful to think of contractibility of the space of composites in analogy? with the canonical isomorphisms between objects satisfying the same universal property in algebra. Right, uh, great. So um, what it would mean to for have a, 
so in, in algebra, we're kind of down in this ordinary one categorical world. And uh, what it would mean to have a fundamental groupoid, so a, a, this one dimensional category version of the fundamental infinity groupoid, be contractible is exactly that. So, um, so to say that uh, pi one, uh, to say a, an ordinary category is contractible, it's very similar to the condition that I just stated here. It means that for each pair of objects in the category, there's a unique, there exists a unique arrow um, from one to the other, and in fact, in both directions. And in fact, these will be inverse isomorphisms. So, um, so yes, a way to understand the uniqueness encoded in many uh, universal properties in ordinary category theory is exactly that. It's saying that some groupoid of all the terminal objects in your category or whatever is, is contractible. Um, so there is an analogy there. Um, there's something richer, though, that I would argue going on um, when we, we move from the notion of contractibility of a one dimensional object like a category to contractibility of an infinite dimensional object like an infinity groupoid, um, because it's it's the analog of that in all higher dimensions. So in a, to say that an infinity groupoid is contractible uh, no longer means that there exists a unique arrow from X to Y, but there does certainly exist an arrow from X to Y. Then if I had any uh, sort of region composed by paths of arrows, then there would exist uh, some two-dimensional arrow inhabiting that region. And then if I have any region formed by uh, two-dimensional arrows, there would exist a three-dimensional arrow inhabiting that region and so on and so forth. So um, it's not at all like the notion of uniqueness that we're familiar with. It's, it's kind of co-inductive in a sense. It's sort of saying that, uh, you know, there may be many, many different arrows from X to Y, but they're all related by some higher cells and those higher cells are related by some higher cells and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of cool. Yeah, uh, there is an, there is also another question. Uh, is, there, uh, is there any data that the fundamental infinity groupoid does not witness? Well, it, I mean, it depends on who you ask. Uh, so if you're asking a homotopy theorist, uh, there's a notion of when are two spaces the same um, by asking them to be kind of weak homotopy equivalent. And it's a theorem or it's part of the desiderata of a definition, depending on your perspective on the homotopy hypothesis, that uh, two spaces are equivalent in that sense, if and only if their fundamental infinity groupoids are equivalent. So that's what I meant by saying it was a complete invariant. Um, of course, there are other things that you might care about about a particular space, is maybe some sort of geometric information or smooth structure, or whatever, and that's uh, not this perspective at all. <laughs> so. Great. Uh, any further questions? Uh, there, there, there are no no more questions right now. Okay, wonderful. All right, so let's let's see if we can go back to this analogy between uniqueness and contractibility and approach it from another way. So that was an example where a contractibility condition replaces uniqueness condition, uh, but let's now just explore the meaning of uniqueness in mathematics. So what does it mean to say that a set C has a unique element? So, uh, or how would you prove that a set has a unique element? Uh, you know, I sometimes teach an intro to proofs course. So a, a strategy for proving it is you would first show that there exists some element X of C, and then for all other elements Y of C, X and Y are equal. So this is a statement written in uh, sort of the language of first order logic in set theory that says that the set C has a unique element. Okay, so let's analyze this statement. So this last piece, this X equals Y, is what's called a predicate. So that's a mathematical statement that's either true or false, but the truth value, whether it's true or false, is depending on the explicit uh, values taken by two free variables. So we could imagine uh, C is the set of natural numbers, for instance, and X and Y are variables that range over the natural numbers. So whether this expression is true or false depends, of course, on which number is X and which number is Y. So three is equal to three, but three is not equal to four, for instance. Um, so that's the notion of a predicate. It's a family of mathematical statements with some free variables. And once you've plugged in something for those variables, it's either true or false. Okay, but we're gonna take a slightly different point of view um, in something that I might call in quotes, proof relevant mathematics. We could instead interpret this X equals Y and I've changed the color and that's a deliberate thing. 
uh, rather than a, a thinking of it as some sort of logical statement that's either true or false, we're interpreting it as a set of all proofs that X is equal to Y. So I'm using this purple color for sets at the moment. Uh, so this X equals Y uh, in exactly the same notation as before, but in a different color is now the set of proofs that X is equal to Y. So if X and Y are not in fact equal, this should be an empty set. You know, we shouldn't have a proof that X is equal Y in that case. Um, but uh, if X and Y are equal, maybe there are multiple proofs of that fact and we're gonna collect all of them together as elements of this set. So that's our point of view. So if this X equals Y is a set, uh, I mean, really it's an indexed family of sets because for each X and C and for each Y and C, I have this set of proofs that you know may or may not be empty. And I can form some constructions in set theory. So I could take the product over all Y's and C of these sets. Uh, this is now a family of sets that's indexed just by X. And then I could take the sum over all X's, so the disjoint union over all X's of the product over all Y's of these sets of proofs that X is equal to Y. Why am I doing this? Well, maybe at this stage, I'm just inspired by some sort of notational analogy. This symbol kind of looks like this symbol and the symbol kind of looks like that symbol if you squint. Uh, so this is some uh, set. This is the construction of a set that is somehow an analogy with this expression in first order logic. And in proof relevant mathematics, this will turn out to be a set of proofs of something or other. And let's investigate what are proofs of. Okay. So what I'm saying is we have a, a background set C and we're thinking about elements in C and we're writing this X equals Y in purple to be the set of proofs that X is equal to Y, which you know might be empty or might have many inhabitants. So what is an element now of this set? So when I have an element of a set that's formed as a disjoint union over a bunch of X's of something or other. So an element in here first uh, is a choice of some element C and C that's telling us kind of which component of this disjoint union I'm in uh, together with an element of this second set. And what is an element of this set? So uh, the, the product of a family of sets you can think of as an element of that product as a dependent function. So for each, let's say Z in C, I would get an element of this set, in this case, C is equal to Z. So what is that? That's a proof for every Z in C that C is equal to Z because C equals Z is the set of proofs that C is equal to C. So putting that all together, an element of this set is a pair comprised of an element, little c of c, together with a proof that for all z and c, c equals z. But what that is together is it's this, the set of proofs that c contains a unique element. If I had that information together, I'm proving exactly that c contains a unique element. So this construction on sets gives us a set of proofs that c contains a unique element, which again might be empty if it's not true. You know, if, if C has three elements or if C has no elements, then this is going to result in an empty set. Okay, so where we're going, uh, the rest of the talk, we're going to see now that if we replace the set C by a topological space, then we can in, again interpret this expression as a code that defines another topological space. And we'll think of it as a space of proofs of something about C. And the question is, what are we proving about C by constructing a point in this space? So here's the preview uh, for the second half of the talk. So if we have a space C, I'm going to explain how this is a code that defines another space, which we can interpret as a space of proofs of something, and then it remains to discover what we're proving. Okay, so what I need to explain is how, how on earth we would interpret an expression like this as defining another space if C starts as a space. And to explain that, I'm going to use a bit of a digression to explain the analogy that we glossed over on the last side. So uh, we had kind of a loose notational analogy between the existential and universal quantifiers in logic and the disjoint sum and uh, Cartesian product operations in set theory. And let me see what I can say about all of that. Okay, so here's a bit of a di digression. So let's imagine that S and T are sets and F is a function from S to T. So these are just ordinary sets, ordinary functions. And if I had any function like this, this is going to induce order preserving functions between their power sets, between the sets of subsets. So P of S is the set of all subsets of S, P of T is the set of all subsets of T. And from F, I get three different order preserving functions. Um, each of these are functors, I guess, if you want to think of these uh, power sets as categories with the morphisms given by inclusion. 
In fact, they're adjoint functors. That's what I've indicated with this turnstile, but let's ignore all of that. So what are these constructions? So this thing that I've written as delta sub f, that's a function from p of t to p of s, that's the inverse image function. So it takes a subset b of t and returns the subset of s comprised of those elements little s so that f of s is in b. Uh, that's just the construction of the inverse image. This thing that I've written there exists sub f is what's more commonly called the direct image. So direct image is something that goes from the power set of s to the power set of t. It takes a subset of s to the subset of t comprised of those elements little t so that there exists some s in s that is in the fiber over t so that f of s is equal to t and also uh, s is in a the specified subset here and this final construction this one's somehow less familiar i'm just going to call the push forward this thing i've written for all f so it takes a subset a of s to the subset of t comprised of those little t so that for all little s's that are in the fiber over t, so all s's so that f of s is equal to t, then s is in a. So note there's an existential quantifier here and a universal quantifier here that's reflected in the notation. Okay, so um, these constructions are already kind of cool. And when I was an undergraduate, I was a bit mystified by the fact that the inverse image construction and set theory seemed so much better behaved than the direct image construction. You know, the direct image preserves uh, unions but not intersections while the inverse image preserves both intersections and unions um, an explanation for that is uh, exactly the adjointness between these constructions these are adjoint functors and a useful fact about adjoint functors is left adjoints preserve colimits so in this diagram these two are the left adjoints and right adjoints preserve limits so this one is again a right adjoint and this is a right adjoint so in this context, uh, the co-limits are the unions, the limits are the intersections. So the fact that this inverse image is both a left and right adjoint is really the reason why it's the better behaved construction. Okay, that's really, that's a digression within the digression. <laughs> um, let's think of an example. So uh, we have these constructions for any function between arbitrary sets S and T, but let's suppose T is a singleton set. So there's a unique function from a set S to a singleton set. So I've uh, called f the unique thing and uh, these again are going to reduce to uh, order preserving functions between the power sets here i have the power set of s as before now i have the power set of the singleton set which has just exactly two elements the empty set and the singleton set itself okay let's take a slightly different point of view so uh, previously we were thinking about the power set as the set of all subsets of s but we can also think of it as the set of all predicates on s so in exactly the sense as before, so this little p of s is some statement that's either true or false as s varies over s. Uh, the corresponding subset is those s's that make p of s true. So if I, uh, there's this bijective correspondence between predicates on a set s and uh, uh, elements of the power set or subsets of s, and it's, it's given exactly here. It's the subset that, of the values of the variable that make the expression true. So from that point of view, it's natural to identify the two elements of the power set of the singleton set as follows. So we could think of the set itself as a code that means true and the empty set as a code that means false. And with those interpretations, I can redefine these constructions in this way. Um, so I'll focus on these two because they're the more important for us. So this uh, first construction here is a function that sends a predicate P of S so that's identified with this, it's truth set. So that's this A and S and then returns. Uh, so a subset of the singleton set uh, and what is it? So it's contains the element uh, exactly when there exists some S and S uh, so that uh, this condition is vacuous and then S is an A meaning that the predicate is true. So in other words, uh, it's gonna send the predicate P of S to true sort of exactly when there exists some S and S so that P of S. So it's really the predicate that's encoding the sentence for all S and S P of S is true. And similarly, this other construction, so this A of S is a truth set of some predicate uh, P of S, it's sending it to the subset of the singleton that contains an element exactly when this condition is satisfied. And this condition says that for every S and S, this is automatically true, that S has to be one of the things that made the predicate true. So in other words, it's sending the predicate P of S to the sentence for all S and S P of S. And that's what explains this notation. There exists and for all, it's because of these existential and universal quantifiers 
here. Um, so if you're if you want to see more about this, the thing to Google is quantifiers as adjoints. This was originally an observation of Bill Lavier. Okay, so this is kind of classical logic, kind of a categorical point of view on something in classical logic. But now let's kind of move into proof relevant mathematics. So uh, here, instead of having a predicate, which is some statement that's either true or false, as S varies over a set S, I'm going to um, replace this post set, whose elements were these predicates, by the category, which is a slice category of S over S. This is an element here is an S indexed set. So again, an object in this category is a family of sets. So rather than a family of statements, it's a family of sets. Uh, I'm writing P of S again, but with a capital letter. And this you can think of as the set of proofs of some predicate little P of S on S and S. So in proof relevant mathematics, we don't just care that P of S is true, we care how it's proven. So we're thinking of a set of proofs as opposed to just the statement itself. And uh, for any function from S to T, we have uh, these functions back and forth exactly as we did before. And I'm uh, using similar notation. So uh, if I have a T index family of sets, uh, the first function, this thing, which I'm writing delta of F, you might think of it as substitution. So uh, Q of T is a family of sets indexed by an element of T. If I use my function F, I can sort of substitute in there and get a family of sets indexed by S. Sorry, that should be F of S. So for each little s, I can plug F of S in where the T is, and that's giving me an S indexed family of sets. So this uh, next construction going this way is some sort of sum construction. So if I had an S indexed family of sets, I could uh, get a T indexed family of sets by taking the sum over all of the elements in the fiber over T, the little s's in the fiber over T of those sets P of S. This is this disjoint sum operation as before. And this final construction, this pi of f is called uh, the product or maybe a push forward. So it takes a index family of sets, an S index family of sets to the T index family of sets, where the value at T is the product over the S's and the fiber of these P of S's. So these are constructions that you can make on the category, uh, these uh, categories of S index sets and T index sets. And they're related in the same way. So each of these constructions are in fact functors and these are adjoint functors with that the left adjoint, this the middle and the other one, the right adjoint. Um, and this is gonna give us a for more formal way to understand this construction that we've seen already of uh, this set of proofs. So let's uh, revisit that construction and try and see it. So um, recall, I'm writing x equals y in purple for the set of proofs that x is equal to y, where this x and y are both elements of C. Uh, and we can think of this as an indexed set. So I have a set of proofs for each value of x and y and C. So in other words, for each element of the product uh, C times C. So I can apply this product construction. So that's this uh, lower adjoint by pushing forward along the projection functor that takes my pair x, y, and just remembers x. This is going to give us, if we uh, specialize this construction, that's going to give us this index family of sets where I've taken the product over y and c of the sets of proofs that x is equal y. I'm thinking of this as an index family of sets in x. And then I could take the sum along the unique function from c to thing, uh, c to the point. This is just giving us a set. And what is it? It's the set that's the disjoint union over the x's and x of the y's and c of uh, the set of proofs that x equals y. Remember, this is the set whose elements are proofs that the set c contains a unique element. Now, our goal was to have an analogous construction in a different category, in the category of topological spaces. And that's exactly what the language of category theory lets you do, because I've expressed this construction abstractly in the language of these adjoint functors on set, I can just redo it uh, using the same adjoint functors on topological spaces. So for this to work, I need a suitably nice category of topological spaces. So firstly, I need my category of topological spaces to be Cartesian closed. I need to have mapping space constructions, um, but really I need it to be locally Cartesian closed. Um, this right adjoint, this product functor only exists if the category is locally Cartesian closed. So something like simplicial sets representing topological spaces would work well here. Okay. So now I'm, I'm just going to mimic this construction, but take as input a space C. And by applying these adjoints successfully, successively, we're going to construct a new space, which has this notation. But I need to start there with this x equals y as being a topological space. So previously, this was the set of proofs that x are equal to y. 
Now X and Y are two points in a space C, and there's a bit of insight that I could uh, talk about after the talk if you want, um, kind of inspired by uh, per Martin Luff's uh, notion of identity and dependent type theory that suggests, in, and uh, then later ideas by Hoffman, Schreiker, Voivodsky, et cetera, uh, that we should interpret this as the space of paths in C from a point X to a point Y. So previously, this X equals Y was a set of proofs that X and Y are equal as elements of a set C. But now when X and Y are points in a space, I'm going to interpret this as a space of paths in C from the point X to the point Y. So from that starting point, this is a space of proofs. And now let's see what they are proofs of. So in other words, the question we're trying to answer is what is a point in this space? And let's unravel its construction. So uh, a point in this space, uh, I didn't entirely explain uh, how these constructions work on topological spaces, but I'll do so now. So this uh, disjoint sum construction in topological spaces is interpreted in a continuous fashion. What it's really forming is the total space of a vibration. So I'm still, uh, I will still have a fiber over each element of X and C, and that's uh, a, this type of space, but these, uh, these fibers aren't disjoint, they're sort of right next to each other. In any case, a point in here is given by a choice, or sorry, I mean, they don't overlap either, but they're not disconnected, that's what I'm trying to say. So a point in the space is given by a choice of a base point, so as before, that's telling us which component we're in, together with a, a point in this remaining space. And so this latter point, again, I need to interpret this in a, this construction in a continuous way because I'm in the category of spaces and continuous functions. So it's given by a continuous function from uh, C um, to the space of paths in C from the point, the chosen base point C to whatever point I had as input. So this is kind of a continuous dependent function. So what exactly is this data? So the, the data again is, has two pieces. One of it is a choice of a base point C and C. And then I have a continuous function for all other points, uh, Z and C, that produces a path from C to Z. I could kind of draw a cartoon of that. So I'm, I'm getting data of paths from C to Z and from C to Y and from C to X. And these paths are chosen continuously uh, as Z, Y, Z, W, all uh, vary over points in C. So what that is, that data is a base point in C and a contracting homotopy. So in other words, a point in the space is a proof that C is contractible. And we can think of this as the space of proofs that C is a contractible space. Um, so let me give a summary. So this, this is really giving a glimpse of the meeting of uniqueness in this new proposed foundation system for mathematics called uh, homotopy type theory. So what we've seen is that in logic, a proof of the statement there exists X and C for all Y and C X equals Y shows that C has a unique element. In sort of proof relevant mathematics, an element of the set, which is the disjoint sum over X and C of the product over Y's and C of the set of proofs that X equals Y is a proof that C is a unique element. Uh, in homotopy type theory, a point in this space is a proof that C is contractible. And that's a, a sort of more precise form of the analogy between contractibility and uniqueness. Um, let me take one more moment and try and explain why I'm so excited about this idea. So uh, one of my primary research areas is infinite dimensional category theory. And a kind of confusing thing in infinity category theory is that it's common to uh, sort of trying to talk about infinity categories without actually giving a definition of an infinity category. And when you do give a definition of an infinity category, it goes by a funny name. You might define something like a quasi category or something like a complete Siegel space or a Siegel category. All of these are kind of technical presentations of this notion of an infinity category. And the real issue is that uh, kind of the classical set based foundations for mathematics aren't really suitable for giving a clean definition of what an infinity category is. And the issue is exactly this uh, kind of slippery notion of uniqueness in a infinity category. It's not true that any arrow from X to Y and any arrow from Y to Z has a unique composite. But what is true is that there is a contractible space of composites for any composable pair of arrows. So I have a vision uh, in the future that perhaps uh, the mathematical community will have gotten used to this idea of thinking of contractible spaces contractibility as a new expression of uniqueness. And 
maybe even reinterpret unique to mean that the space of such is contractible. And then we could say something like in an infinity category, any composable pair of arrows has a unique composite and uh, start to understand this stuff a lot more simply. Thanks very much. Thank you very much to Emily uh, to, uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, so a virtual applause for her. And uh, Rina, David, um, please go ahead. If there are any, any other questions? There, there weren't. There were the, <laughs> um, we have, we have, we have, however, we do have a comment from Professor Bennett that there is much applause in Cardwell 101. Uh, besides, besides being live streamed over the entire web, Emily, you were live streamed into our largest lecture hall that the, that the math department usually has in its gift. And um, many of our grad students and faculty heard you there where you would have spoken had you been able to come, so. Great, well, I'm sorry I wasn't there in person, but I'm happy you were able to see it nevertheless. Yeah. Well, one more thank you to Emily. Thank you so much to everyone for attending this talk. Uh, so the, I want to say that the next talk of the Women Lecture Series is by uh, Jennifer Valacristan from Boston College, and it will be on October uh, 28th. Uh, thank you to everyone. Sorry, uh, September 28th. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending. And again, thank you, Emily, uh, for this wonderful talk. Sure. Uh, we have, uh, so someone says in the chat that they, they have a question and they're, I think they're now busy, busy typing it. Uh, But um, yeah, there are there are a lot of thank yous in the chat. So everyone is everyone is saying thank you, and this is a great talk. Yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not. I'm not sure how how long we should wait for the person to uh, type their question. And, uh, another uh, another person is saying that they uh, okay. He, there there it goes. Uh, do you or anyone in the comments happen to know the general relation between equational log logic and higher categories? Does this notion of uniqueness help? Uh, I, I guess I don't know exactly the sense in which the, the question is meant, um, but I can say that there's something consistent about this notion of uniqueness. So, um, so the homotopy type theory uh, is inspired by an interpretation of uh, dependent type theory, which is a kind of much older formal system for uh, writing mathematical constructions, stating uh, mathematical statements, proving theorems uh, in a new setting. So, um, so due to Per Martin Luff in the 1970s, there's a, a notion of identity types that uh, handle sort of proofs of equality in this type theory. So, in this sort of mathematical foundation system. And uh, it's a pretty inspiring definition. It says that identity types are freely generated by proofs of reflexivity, and there's kind of nothing else in there. Um, transitivity and symmetry and all of that follow. Um, but anyway, for a long time, it was thought that this notion of what it means to say that x equals y is pretty similar to the one that we're used to in set theory. Um, uh, and um, sort of surprisingly, starting in the 1990s and then in the 2000s, there were more uh, exotic models found. So uh, Vladimir Vovatsky in uh, the first decade of the 21st century proved that this formal system, this type theory, which is, a, again, a formal way for writing mathematical statements, can be interpreted uh, where a type um, 
gets mapped to a space, uh, maybe more precisely a con complex, that's a particular sort of simplicial set. Uh, and um, the uh, identity types get uh, mapped to path spaces. So it's consistent, uh, the presence of this interpretation says it's consistent to think of a proof that X is equal to Y as a path in a space from X to Y. Um, and uh, he then uh, observed that this construction, that this uh, expression that's written in type theory in the model um, is exactly the assertion that the space C is contractible. So that's validating the consistency of this point of view. And um, several mathematicians working in this area are excited by it as well. So. We have two, two more questions in the chat. And the first is, has anyone explored a similar notion of contractibility starting from a motivation in quantifier free logic systems? I have absolutely no idea what a quantifier free logic system is. So I guess you don't have the quantifiers. I don't know. Um, that's a great question for somebody else. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there is another question. How would your idea of contractibility be used in the context of weak N categories? Right. I mean, I think a lot of what's complicated in, uh, you know, weak end categories is just things aren't unique anymore in the sense that we're familiar with them being. Um, so if by end category, you really mean sort of a category that stops at level N as opposed to an infinity N category, uh, it's a little less clear to me um, how to think about those. So, so the advantage of infinity N categories is sort of at the top level, uh, we have um, spaces and to assert that those spaces are contractible is then a, a very natural thing um, once you get used to that sort of thing. So, um, right, so uh, the, I guess the summary is the, the hope is that uh, contractibility could replace uniqueness in places where uniqueness is missing. but ought to be there. I mean, sometimes things just aren't unique, you know? I mean, many elements have lots of symmetries, for instance, not unique symmetries, but, you know, in, in areas where something really should be unique, the hope is that maybe instead there's a contractible space. Uh, there are no more questions at this point. Great, well, thanks very much. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Emily, again. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone.